My name is Julie Pearson Littlefender. Today is Friday, February 13th, 2015, and I'm interviewing Tom Mooney at the Tulsa Tahlequah Public Library for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at OSU. Uh, Tom, you just recently retired from your job at the Cherokee National Museum, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about you, your long association with the Trail of Tears art show, and which started in 1971 and quickly became one of the premier shows in the state. The first uh, probably annoying question I need to get out of the way is whether you're any relation to ethnologist James Mooney, who wrote about the Cherokee in the late 19th century. I've been asked that many times, and no, I'm not. I keep saying he's too smart to be kin to me. <laughs> where were you born, and where did you grow up? I was born in Tulsa. That was a special trip, though. I was I lived my entire childhood in Mounds, Oklahoma, which is 25 miles south of Tulsa. I went to school there, and. Uh, and then continued on to Oklahoma City University for my bachelor's and the University of Tulsa for my master's. Now, what did your folks do for a living? My father, when I was born, he was working for a place called Telco, Telco, Tulsa Training School, which uh, he taught artwork there. Oh. He was a sign painter by profession. He um, worked A sign painter? Sign painter. He worked for Coca-Cola and then for Douglas Aircraft and then on uh, his own, yeah. and uh, my mother primarily was in, in the newspaper business. She worked uh, about 20 years selling newspaper advertising and then became the editor of the Society page, or Women's Page as they called it there, and uh, at the Sepulpa Herald. In, in the Sepulpa Herald? Yes. Okay. Are you Cherokee, and if so, what side of your family? I guess I'm one of those wannabes or out of looks. They, uh, on my mother's side, there was a story told of a lady who was uh, Cherokee back in North Carolina. She was born really in the heart of the Cherokee Nation in the 1700s, and uh, they went over the hill and were on the wrong side to ever be enrolled. And uh, the family does make applications on the Ian Miller application in 1906, and also on the Dell's application in 1996. The, um, I've talked to over with another person in the family who's a genealogist were both convinced that they were more concerned about getting free land than they were about uh, being really proud of being Cherokee. But uh, on my father's side, uh, his mother uh, made application to the Dallas Commission, but they were living in Arkansas, and so uh, they were going to be Mississippi Choctaws. And I think she was something too. I, so I, the bloodline I think is out there, but uh, we did this whole argument about who is, who isn't, and. Uh, I'm just not quite as building as some people are about uh, pressing the point. And you uh, mentioned that your, your your father had this sign painting background. What what was your exposure to art in your home growing up? He was actually, he wanted to be a cartoonist, but uh, he, at one point, when he got to work for Disney, but he couldn't afford the trip out there. And uh, Did he have an interview? No, he just couldn't get... To, California. And that was his true love. He would sit in church, for example, doodling on uh, church buildings, drawing little cartoon characters. And uh, but the sign painting was what made the bread and butter around the household. And he was uh, occasionally called upon to do some artwork there. As far as art in the household, it was not a lot of artwork. That he, he didn't paint. He did one painting I know of, and uh, so there wasn't too much there. But he sort of thought of art as his. He loved artwork. And possibly. So it, when we'd have out of town visitors, we'd always uh, throw them in the car, take them up to Gilcrease or Philbrook, Willow Rock, we had a little more time. We made a lot of trips to those places. So. What were your impressions? You were very young when you were going to those museums, I guess. Oh, I loved it up there. It was, uh, I always looked forward. I wasn't. For some reason, the uh, Gilberts impressed me more than the Philbrook, uh, and um, just I guess the European paintings were that fascinating to me. You mentioned that you liked Gilcrease Museum more than Philbrook. Why was that? I guess the European art didn't was as fascinating to me. I did like the uh, Indian art downstairs. They had Philbrook, and um, 
also, Mr. Gilchrist came from the mountains area, and I felt that because the hometown boy, he was. Uh, there's a house out there that we used to play in sometimes. The Gilchrist family. You can drive down this one road, and uh, there's a abandoned two-story house out there with some of the Gilchrist family members still buried on the site there. You had to park on the road and cross a gate and go down this uh, dark path, which was. Uh, for a bunch of kids, it's paid to scare you. And you get up there and uh, we never did anything bad, but uh, we did uh, have parties out there. Other people did, not me, but uh, they probably burnt the house down at one point, one of the parties. But so that's, you know, he was chair at Creek, and so he got all his money that way in the oil business. Right. Were there specific native artists that you were paying attention to, or you just did you just know you like native artists? At that point, uh, I guess one of the big exposures was AC Blue Eagle uh, did a set of tumblers for an oil company. They put these out, and uh, that's probably my first awareness of a native artist. I guess and, uh, my mother had gone to school with Cecil Dick, and she talked about him sometimes, and uh, so she said he was. I was doodling in class and uh, throw these pieces of paper on the floor and stuff. And uh, she said she wished she'd pick a bunch of those papers up now and kept them because uh, they, I guess would have been quite valuable at some point. <laughs> um, how about your exposure to art in elementary school and middle school? Zero to none. It was a small school and we didn't, there were no art classes to speak of and uh, it didn't happen. Um, where did you attend high school? At Mounds. At Mounds. Any exposure to art in high school? No. Now my father, uh, when he passed away, he did leave somebody to the school for a scholarship fund and to use in the art class. He was, uh, he, in his retirement, spent a few uh, hours up there teaching uh, a voluntary class about artwork. So he enjoyed that part of it. Oh, neat. So what happened after high school? Well, you go to college. I went to OCU, which is Oklahoma City University, and um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, and I sort of got into history. And then you can't do a whole lot with history other than coach basketball or something, and I wasn't a basketball player, so I uh, wasn't a teacher. I went to one class downtown Oklahoma City in the, in the education class, that scared the devil out of me. I'd get out of there and uh, they were all uh, mean looking kids. I, this little small town school boy didn't like the urban school. And so it, but this was an education class? that It was a required education class. So that scared you? Yeah, it scared me. got me out of the system. Because of the students? Oh yeah, I didn't want to be part of that. And, um, what, uh, so I went up there a, a uh, internship class at the Cowboy Hall of Fame. I went there and uh, did that, and uh, I worked different departments out there and got into to where I liked the museum business very well. And the uh, So was it a curatorial kind of internship? The first semester we spent uh, rotating through the various departments. We spent time as a curator, one of the uh, bust of Lincoln came in while we were there, and uh, I saw him, uh, they put it together a forklift. He got the legs, the torso, and the head. And they chipped the piece out, and uh, when Chaco was able to go through there, and I knew where the break was, and he fixed it so he couldn't see it. And, uh, now, he was, I it, hadn't heard of him. Can you repeat his name? He was Juan Manchaca. He came from the uh, from Denver. And he did the best for. Well, he the, was no, it wasn't by James Earl Frazier, but the, oh, okay. uh, the uh, repair work on it when they moved, set it up yes. to him. And yes. End of the trail, sitting up there. To, uh, flatbed trailer while I was there. That was wow. So that was an exciting time Once to be there. Once monumental works arrived, you were there. We were carrying some artwork through there one time. I had this big uh, painting flopping around. It was a Thomas Moran. And Dean Craig, who was the director at the time, said uh, it's worth a quarter of a million dollars to so be careful. And then uh, that was too much information. I didn't need that. <laughs> So you got, got hooked so, on the museum business early. I did. Early. It, was just, yeah, it was very nice to be out there. And uh, in the formative years of the Cowboy Hall, too, they weren't that old. It was 1968 when I was there. So it was, they were still young, too. Right. And you were there for just a year? 
as an intern? Well, yeah, two semesters. Two semesters. Um, was it easy for you to go to college? Did you have the money, or did you have to, put, have to work? My parents uh, came through on, on that part of it for me, and uh, I was kind of weird. I had a bowling scholarship of all things. It wasn't uh, like I was on the university bowling team, but it was, uh, it was it sounds like I was. I, <laughs> so that's... Uh, so you did have that bowling scholarship. <laughs> it's through the uh, bowl, youth bowling uh, leagues, and the, I think it's two fifty dollars something like that. It wasn't a whole lot of money, but it's it's kind of neat to say I had a bowling scholarship to go to college with. Right. <laughs> well, so when you graduated from college, your degree was in history. History. You yeah, had this taste for museum work. What did you do after that? Well, I applied to, to University of Tulsa, got in there and got my master's, and then in history I also. applied to every museum I could think of and uh, didn't get anything at all at first. And um, worked in a paint store for about three or four years. Uh, an art paint store or no, regular a, paint store? Just a regular paint store, Cook, Cook Paint and Varnish Company. And learned a lot about business transactions there, I guess, how to keep. Uh, books and uh, the opportunity to come to the uh, Cherry Heritage Center came up, so I went there very willingly because it was I'm back in my hometown basically. Uh, my mother's from Tahlequah, and uh, I'm very familiar with the town. I'm glad to be here. I love it here, and you can't get me out of it hardly. <laughs> I, just, I can't imagine being in one of these large towns that uh, have, have five traffic every day. Right. That's, so, but you are arriving in Tahlequah with your master's in history, mm -hmm. and what what job title did you have? My original title at the Heritage Center was historical researcher, and titles there don't mean a whole lot because uh, the staff gets called upon to do a lot of jobs that they aren't uh, fully trained for, or uh, it can be very unexpected. The uh, I came there in December of '76. It was a uh, very slow time, which I didn't realize that the museum was so seized so it's probably three-fourths of the business comes in the summertime, and uh, I'm in the basement of the museum, this library with uh, the archives was in one little file cabinet, so it's grown a lot since then, but uh, I thought to myself, dear God in heaven, what have I done to myself? Uh, I'm still <laughs> single, and I'm, I'll never see anybody down here. <laughs> and it's been the most fascinating place to work at, though, to meet people. Uh, I was very early put into the genealogy area, which uh, gets a lot of traffic that way. And uh, then uh, just celebrities come through there. There's people who drop through that uh, went to the Henry Ford at the uh, drama one night. And uh, Dr. Ruth, the sex doctor, came through uh, for a women's conference they were having. And just um, we've had. More recently, uh, Justice Senator Dale Connor was visiting, and so I, I met my wife there too. So, <laughs> <laughs> tell but, us uh, about that. Tell us about that encounter. Oh, it was. I met her there. I later, get dating her, so it was not a lot to tell there. But, but so all this worked out pretty good. To my, uh, I mean, I've enjoyed my time there. I was there 38 years, and uh, in that length of time, a lot of stuff happens, and. Uh, some good, some bad, but uh, that was one of the better things that happened to me. Right. And so the archives were originally, as you said, just in this well, one, it was, it was one, one file cabinet. We had about six boxes of photographs in there and some letters and uh, just odds and ends, and it really wasn't that big. And later we acquired the uh, papers from Chief Keeler. And when her boy Pierce passed away, we got his collection and some other. Fairly sizable. Uh, there's someone out there by uh, Philip Viles, who is Supreme Court Justice. And just, well, it's been fascinating to see these things come in as they right. arrive. As, and, uh, as you acquire them. Um, so the Trail of Tears show itself was only like four years old when you arrived there. Uh, I think it started six, in 71. My first was sixth annual. Six, oh, sixth annual, okay. Started in 72, and uh, okay. at first it was out in the ancient village. They mm -hmm. tied it to the trees and things, and just 
So the was, artwork was. Yeah, it's hung on trees. Was hung from trees. Right. Okay, that was before. Then they um, built the museum in '74. Okay. And began having shows in there, and uh, my first year was, of course, spring of '77, and it's having a trail years art show. I didn't know what the thing was, and uh, it really wasn't that impressive of a show. It was. Uh, what was the focus of the show then? Every piece of artwork had to be Trail of Tears theme. Oh, okay. And then they had two categories, uh, contemporary and traditional. And the traditional was the flat style with the, no shading or anything. And uh, very few people entered that part of the show. Uh, it was mostly the contemporary that they entered. And by 1979, they got down, as, as I remember, they had nine artists entering 14 pieces. Wow. Were yeah. any of those artists names that we would recognize? If, if I remember them not, yeah, they would be, but um, the show was open to all artists, and um, at that time we had been kind of a decision about whether or not to uh, continue the show or what to do with it, and it was desperately in trouble, so we knew that, and uh, at about the same time, Philbrook was dropping their show, so um, the Indian there, there was a void there. We got together a committee of uh, artists to uh, make changes, recommend changes, and then... Uh, Were they just from Tahlequah, or...? Um, well, the group stayed pretty much the same. I'm not sure who was in there at what time, but it was uh, Troy Anderson, uh, Bill Rabbit, Jeannie Rorix, um, or the nucleus of it, and then there was uh, well, two or three others. I'm sorry, I can't remember. But they... Uh, Made, the recommendations were that we drop the uh, Trail of Tears theme requirement as part of the show, but pertain it as a category. And then about uh, paintings, sculptures, and, um, graphics of any theme. And prior and, to that, had you had sculptures? Was was 3D a category as long as it was Trail of Tears or not? I don't believe it was. I think it was a whole painting. Okay. And they. Uh, had these four categories, and uh, the next year, well, another th thing was the artwork had to stay in the museum for about three months uh, originally, and they wanted to have it in and out uh, tied up for less time, and so I think it was a four-week show at that time, and then we had a um, re request for more money as prize money. The pr grand reward was $350. Wow. So, <laughs> In November of 79, a man named Gene Hollitman came to be our development officer, and he worked with the Getty Oil Company to be the sponsor of the show, and he always felt that the Getty guy passing out these very small checks was a little bit embarrassed by it, and uh, so Getty increased their support the following year, and well, in 80, we had a lot of entries, so I'm going to guess 180 or so. And were they from across the country? They get more participation in it, and yeah, it was uh, more of a national show, but uh, when they got the increased prize money in, then it uh, it went up to over 300 pieces at that time, and um, we, you know, I'm used to coming in there having four or five artists of curious work in, maybe one or two arrive by mail at one point, and then all of a sudden you're getting this barrage of mail from the post office. You go down there and many boxes, there's the bus station sending stuff in, and uh, UPS arriving with it, and uh, it just got really out of hand real fast. And, uh, <laughs> and you we, were the one that took the artwork in. Yes, and then we had another thing going where you go down to um, Norman or Oklahoma City and pick up art there as a remote pickup. And the timeline of the show was um, really pressing because it would we would have a Sunday deadline on it. A Sunday and deadline. One person would be in Oklahoma City, usually me, picking it up down there. And, Coming back to Telco about midnight, and we spent all night setting up, um, segregating the art by category. And by this time, we added the miniatures as a theme because uh, I think it's Troy Anderson suggested that we do this because uh, people could buy a name artist at a smaller price, and uh, it's been a very popular category. He was right on that. And um, anyway, I'd come back with his artwork in the middle of the night. <laughs> Almost uh, on Sunday, and they would stay up all night there, putting all the paintings in one area, and the sculptures over here, and this 
so forth, and uh, the judge would the next day and would uh, judge the artwork and uh, then we'd bring in the guy to hang the stuff. And my job got to be uh, preparing the uh, list of artwork for the public. And back in this time, we didn't have uh, computers or anything, so you had to take everything to a proof uh, typesetter and then proofread her stuff, then bring it back to make corrections and then get it uh, printed up. And it, it was always an all-nighter on Friday night. Before it woke. In fact, we opened the show on uh, Friday for a while there too, and uh, we was back to Saturday later on. It was a uh, severe time crunch. It sounds like it. So you, you mentioned we, there were a couple of other people who were employees at the Heritage Center who helped with sub separating out the artwork into the categories. Well, it'd be the entire like, staff, whoever that was there at the time. Whoever was there at the yeah, time. Yeah, it was all hands on deck for this thing. <laughs> How about the early um, jurying process? How were the judges chosen? That was another part of the artist's thing. They wanted to be get away from using a local judge. They wanted to bring in somebody from maybe New Mexico or whatever. And was it a single judge? It's been a single, uh, two, three, whatever, uh, depending on the year. and. Uh, I decided that uh, two judges about the worst of all worlds, though, because you'd have a strong judge, weak judge, or um, one of them dominate the other, and uh, you just get one judge out there and then all wrap the one person. Uh, the artists themselves, uh, if they win, the judge is excellent. If they lose, uh, they didn't know anything or something. But uh, it, it's always a crapshoot on the who, what the judge is liking. If they some judges, I, I guess you didn't what I've thought of people anyway. Um, I, I see the uh, senior side of judging at this point. Uh, one, one or twice I've, I've seen the uh, judge not give an award to an artist because, uh, well, that guy can do better than that. You're fighting against yourself. Or wow. There was one year we had a thing called Special Merit Awards where uh, we didn't do the one, two, three system, but we did uh, best of category. And then rather than having um, limits on what awards could be given each category, if you had half the show being uh, painting and the other half being, you might give a lot more merit awards in the one category here. Uh, I saw one year two judges fight it out over. Um, which these two special merit awards were the best of show. They couldn't agree, so out of nowhere comes a third piece that now is best of show. And it would, that wasn't even would being it, considered. Would, would, yeah, and uh, so it's it just it's you saw crazy. That arbitrariness, sort of, in some of the decisions. There's a judge one year that asked me what I thought was if she got down to two pieces and which one do you like best? And um, this is the miniatures. <laughs> I wouldn't say anything to her, and uh, she finds which one. And I, well, that one. <laughs> you know, was how that got picked. I, wow. Were what well, in terms of were there a lot of native judges, non-native judges? How did that work out? We tried to. Uh, now, the driving force of the show was Bob Rucker. He came over um, from Norman, and he's a collector and everything. And he knew a lot of the judges and so forth. He would. Um, pick them out and uh, but there was a, a pretty good sized party the night before the show with the artists coming down and uh, Bob and a lot of his friends out there uh, had a pig award they'd give out somebody to wear a pig nose around during the show and uh, collect money during this the This was not part of the official That was not part of the show. official show, no, but it was uh, part of the atmosphere that went around there. And um, What were they collecting money for? I don't know. <laughs> A big pig the I next mean, round. <laughs> I remember Junior Rory wearing this pig nose and carrying a pig under it. And, um, but anyway, we uh, had a lot of fun back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was, and the receptions were fun and they did change in character. Like I remember going to some receptions that were dinners and then others. It eventually just well, became more dirt, I part, guess. Part of the thing there was we uh, had to, um, we closed the museum for the entire day. And back in that time, nobody got in on the opening day other than the people who had been invited to the dinner. 
And we uh, rang the bell or blew a whistle, and everybody, the doors opened, and everybody runs up, and didn't buy something. Now it's been strung out to an all-day event, basically, and uh, well, it starts, I guess, this, people look at it all day long, and then they start selling at 6 o'clock or so, but uh, I, I didn't like the uh, lack of decorum about the uh, people rushing in and having gone back the other way now, I kind of wish we were back into the uh, old days now. I think that had a little excitement about it. The, the format people, of everybody having to kind of compete. People would come down there and sneak in, not sneak in, but they just go visit the museum. They could see where the paintings were and they had a little advantage over the people that didn't know where they were. And so we had some committee ahead of time to kind of scope it out. And they'd come down and just put their hand on a sales tag and <laughs> This was for me, mark it up. <laughs> did, you, did you actually have to write up some of the invoices too? Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> Very gladly. <laughs> right. Whatever job you needed to take on. But I, I think working with the artists has been the most enjoyable part of that uh, job I've had over 38 years. It was, uh, I didn't know any of them before I came down there and as a group they're just very nice people that uh, I was very pleased to be with. I was, Envied somebody that could um, look at something and draw it real nice, and uh, just seeing different styles. Uh, you know, we got some that look like photographs that maybe be photographs sometimes, but uh, others that uh, like probably McMurtry would take a uh, coyote and do something very humorous with it. Uh, I always enjoyed Robbie's work, and uh, I'm not much of an abstract person, but then I would see some that uh, I did like very well too. And, I kind of get into the fall, I guess, of uh, beginning to like artist work because I like the artist. You know, I think some of them paint trash, I still like it, but uh, for some guys that I didn't care for could paint a masterpiece, I refuse to admit it. <laughs> as far as personal collecting, though, I, I'm like the Emperor's New Clothes. I go out there at the start of the show. And I'd find a piece I just dearly loved. And I never felt right buying it uh, because we're inviting the buyers there as our guests and uh, I didn't want to jump on a piece of artwork. You kind and, of and after it went there all night long without being sold, I think, what's wrong with it? Nobody likes this piece. I'm not gonna buy that. So. <laughs> That's interesting. I Wait. Been, been through one time with Martha Berry. She had a bag in there and I, bought a little small one of the, hers. Uh -huh. uh, she does lovely work. What, what's a favorite um, story or um, funny story that you have about getting to know an artist down there? There was one that, uh, I don't think it's Cherokee, but it's uh, Darren. Darren Water? No, I was trying to think he's a graphics person. Uh, and that's one of the pieces I got in trouble with too because he did a Madonna piece that um, my wife loved and I didn't buy it and uh, she got she still holds it against me. Um, but he, he was just this quiet, shy little kid came down there and um, kind of like, uh, uh, can, I, can, can I enter the show? And, well, sure, anybody can. Well, I don't know if it's good. And I can see it's very, very good artwork and so I've Never before stick the gallery owner on somebody, but I did put it on him. He, he worked his way up to being selling from seventy-five dollars up to seven hundred fifty dollars something, and he, he was his prices were way too cheap, and um, he's just a very good artist. And, and he didn't have that much confidence. He was he was, about he was very uh, very lacking confidence. And one of the nature, one of the things that our show is designed to do is to build a cottage industry of. Uh, artists that could make their living here and you know later on Mike Daniel um, wanted us to expand the category to include pottery of course but also basketry and uh, the other five categories we've added since then and um, I, I've known Mike since the, we were childhood he lived about half a block from my grandparents here in Delacroix and we played together all the time and uh, he talks very loudly. I don't know if you've ever been around that much, but he uh, has. So he won't enter the uh, make 10 categories of the show, and I was a little bit concerned about that drawing down the uh, purchasing power of the buyers coming there. It's going to dilute it down too much. And uh, 
hell, we can afford the prize money to pay these other guys and all kinds of things. And uh, I met him over at Linda Graver's place in Muskogee one time and the art market there. And I was just messing with him and I said, uh, oh, Mike, we have to drop the Trail of Tears art show. Uh, we can't afford those other categories. And, well, why not, Tom? <laughs> and he, he was speaking loud, and I was just going on with him. And uh, <laughs> Linda thought we were out there getting ready to get into a fight or something. And uh, there's nothing Mike could ever say to me. I want to fight him for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the guy, and it was just, uh, it was just a little exchange going. And she, was, she was very concerned about it, though. <laughs> well, and um, the Trail of Tears category, um, as I remember, I always did have a pretty big prize, a purse attached to a pretty big. Yeah, it's gotten pretty respectable over the years, and uh, it's. Uh, and a special medallion. That, that was a Bob Rucker thing. He had the little, um, for the Grand Award, he had the little uh, blue side pendant with a seal inside, and then he, mm -hmm. he gave little uh, seals to everybody associated with the show. And uh, I got one myself. Uh, as a, as a non-artist, I guess, special merit award of my own, but uh, I still have it, very proud of it. How nice. And um, different artists were asked to do those medallions, weren't they? Not that one, that was a, I think maybe Harvey Pratt may have been the designer of that one. It was just a, the Sherman National Historical Society symbol and um, it says uh, the 16th Annual Show on there or something like that. And, mm -hmm. He stopped doing them around the year 2000. And so so um, in 1991, um, you know, with the passage of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act um, requiring proof of enrollment or a letter of certification from the tribe that an artist could represent that tribe, um, how did that impact the Trail of Tears art show? Well, at first, not at all. We, uh, we were very supportive of those artists who did not uh, have cards. To, um, there's a lot of arguments to that about this biological side, the legal side of being Cherokee. And uh, I think on the one hand, you, it's very ludicrous to say that every Cherokee out there was uh, registered by the Dulles Commission. And we were probably a little bit too freewheeling that we accepted though. We just said, if, if you say you are, you are. and. Uh, I can see the other side of the coin very easily that um, if I were a Cherokee artist with a card, I'd be resentful of somebody coming in there and saying, I am too, and, we, and they couldn't offer that proof. And it's kind of like, I guess, my family itself. We, if that Cherokee blood is in my family, then um, it's a far back that's not really part of my, who I'm made up of. And I don't. I understand the rules, what they're going by now with the uh, Dulles Commission being required to do that. And, uh, there are a lot of friendships involved there too that I just felt sorry for my, my friends. And uh, I thought when they pulled those artists out of the show, it would destroy the show. I was wrong about that. That's, I think the show's really improved over, not, over the years. It's gotten very strong. and. Uh, I miss those people that we ultimately uh, rejected. Uh, it, it it may have made a bump in the show for a year or two, but I think people adjusted to it, and it's uh, back to where it was now. That's there are some people who came into the show because uh, they didn't like being in a show with uh, people who didn't have uh, proof of tribal citizenship. So there's two sides to it, and. Uh, I wish that fight didn't have happened. A lot of good people got broke up friendships because of that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think made the and makes the Trail of Tears show different from, say, the Five Tribes show or Art Under the Oaks? It's. Um, I don't know really. <laughs> it, it's a bigger show, I think, than that, those two, and um, we've tried over the years to bring in a lot of people from out, all across the United States. We've tried to 
really hard to call the Eastern Band of Cherokees. And there's one argument that goes on that if we're mission related, that we wouldn't take uh, non Cherokees in the show. We've, so to answer that, we've put out the Hokum Yard show in the fall, which uh, is a strictly Cherokee show. And has a little bit of different flavor by being taking uh, traditional works like bows and arrows and things. But And that strictly Cherokee show has not been going on quite as long, has it? It's, it's 1995, I believe. Okay. But the other show, uh, Trail, uh, part of what we did there was with the advice of the uh, artist committee again was to involve uh, Southern Art Magazine. See, when Getty sold out to Texaco, Texaco was based in Houston and they took over the show and sponsored it very well as well. And uh, they sort of Insinuated they'd like to have some of the money spent in the Houston area with so they could justify the sponsorship, but also to put ads in Southwest Art Magazine. And we began using the Southwest Art judges rather frequently for um, the show, and that gives a little publicity that way. They would come down and do an interview with an artist that was in the show or how I. We, we tried very much, though, to get particularly the Mexico, Arizona artists out there and along with the Eastern Band of Cherokees. And the uh, Southwest artists showed up pretty well. Right, I remember when the, uh, Susan McGarry came down, I think the first year yeah. that she was a judge down here. And that was another question I had. Um, I think for many artists, in addition to, you know, there's the Trail of Tears show and then if they were winning had won at Trail of Tears a couple of times, you might can, you might go ahead and do a retrospective show for them. I know you did right. that for a number of artists. Any idea how many? We were doing one a year there for a while. It was in the early 90s. We had um, Cecil Dick, uh, Virginia Rorix, Troy Anderson, Bill Rabbit. Uh, Merlin. Uh, um, did did Merlin. Merlin. And uh, well, it made us Doran, I think we did hers. So it was, uh, I enjoyed every one of those shows too. They were just such fun to go ahead and collect the pieces from the art. Oh, I thought I'm not going to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did, so you mentioned some changes. Uh, I'll, I'll, go tell, I'll go tell this one story. It's going to be in trouble okay. too. <laughs> One of them was Virginia uh, Stroud, and uh, there was a gallery in uh, Colorado that uh, loaned some pieces of artwork that, from their clients. And it came down here, and uh, we had, had trouble packing it up to the right size to get it back and everything. And at first, I was supposed to pack it, then they had somebody else that was supposed to take me off the to back to us to get it. That guy quit. This, they put me back in there, and then they hired somebody else. And then the only common name these people up in Colorado had was my name. And they were very committed and killed me. If I ever go up to, up to I think it's Grand Junction, I'm probably going to be dead meat up there. I was just, uh, they were, so they were, the pieces were shipped when they were we, shipped. We, they we, hadn't been we properly We got them back packed. very late. And they I were, see. And they were very, very, they had every right to be as mad as they were. and. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't quite as guilty as they thought I was, but uh, I was sure the only one they had a name for. And they arrived intact, but I, it's just that many My hands were clean, but they were, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wasn't, I was up for, it should have been manslaughter since first degree murder. How about the tribe's involvement with the museum and the show, the Trail of Tears show? How has that changed over the years? Well, they've supported us over the years by uh, giving us, at first, an annual grant. And then since 2005, there's been a thing called the Memorandum of Agreement where they have significantly upped the support of the museum. It's tapering off now, but it, um, specific funding for the Actually, the show's been sponsored by the Chickasaw Nation in the last 
four or five years. What? The show's been sponsored by Chickasaw Nation? Yes. I did not realize that. Yeah. Along with Bank of Oklahoma and people like that, but, uh, yeah, they, they've been. Interesting. <laughs> There's been C and E has given heavy support to the uh, homecoming art show because it's all Cherokee and uh, that's what they 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 have single-handedly um, made that show a success. Mm -hmm. So uh, we owe a lot to C and E on that on that show, which is Cherokee Nation, of course. And so I can't say they don't sponsor our shows at all. That's not true. But um, the homecoming, the Trail Cherry show itself uh, has had. Uh, I guess it's run hot and cold, it's support there. It's been. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that all Cherokee show, is that, is that in conjunction with um, Cherokee holidays or is it a different time? It is now, it didn't start out that way. It, uh, it's been in October, it's been all over the map really, but uh, we now make it appear open around the time the holiday show is in effect. Right. Um, you know, it seems like every aspect of American life and also uh, business um, was hit hard by 9-11 and the Native art artists were hit hard by um, that uh, event too. I was wondering how the Trail of Tears show was affected those first couple years. I'm not sure they had a direct effect there. It's been, um, things may have affected it more with the local economies, uh, the uh, oil failures in the 80s and things that uh, mm -hmm. people there can buy as much as they were normally buying. And uh, it does have its good years and bad years, I'm sure you know, though. It's uh, up and down. <laughs> and we've had certain buyers that come through various years and make the show too and I think the only thing the show is missing now is the uh, buyers they used to have. We used to have, again those parties that Bob Rucker had, uh, he'd bring in four or five uh, of his own friends that uh, would buy pretty heavily and that has, that's gone away now. So now the sales aren't as strong as they used to be in your estimation? Well, but thanks to CNE, they are. So they come back. That's where the, the travel support has come in there, is uh, through CNE. And, uh, and they'll purchase our, pieces our, for the. Our board has stepped up and been buying pieces. But I see. Just the ordinary buyers that uh, collect, I think a lot of them have stopped coming. And, uh, mm -hmm. We used to have someone just look forward to seeing every year, and they, they don't show up now. So in terms of what's going on right now, um, foot traffic, what is that like through the show and what does artists turn out like? And is the prize money roughly the same or has it grown a little? The prize money's gone up quite a bit and the uh, sales, they continue to grow, they really do. And, um, but it's, like I say, it's, it's limited to a smaller group of buyers than it has been in the past. So not as many people coming through just to see the show on the part of the public. No, I used to go out there on Sundays. That we'd open the show on Saturday. It was that that one group was always allowed in there, and uh, Sunday sales would be about fifty percent of what the Saturday sales were. And that doesn't happen anymore. And the people would be they would pay the twenty five dollars to get in by the meal. <laughs> That's a great deal. I mean, you had to, an open bar there. You had to, Prime sitting at the opening of the drama, plus the uh, art show, well, twenty-five dollars. <laughs> right. Is the drama still uh, scheduled to coincide no, with it's, the show? I don't think it'll ever be reopened there. It's uh, that theater is in very bad shape, and there are plans to redo the, the dramas. Maybe there, but other places have been talked about too. So I don't. Right. When did it stop officially? I think 2005, maybe in the last show, uh, mm -hmm. we had 
The last performance of the Trail of Tears by Kermit Hunter was 96. Mm -hmm. Then we began having a series of little summer events there that right. I miss it. I bet. What do you think the impact of the show has been just on the native art landscape in northeastern Oklahoma? I think clearly it's helped it a lot because uh, there are people that um, have relied on that show for a little extra income. Uh, particularly if we added the uh, things Mike Daniel wanted to add to the show, like the uh, baskets and uh, all that. He, We've got a lot of basket makers at Pottery. Pottery's has been really strong now. Yeah. It's been uh, with Jane Austen and people like that working with it. It's uh, the workshops around here, and we've got some very good potters that uh, you didn't see 10 years ago. Absolutely. I don't remember if Anna Mitchell ever entered the show with a pot. She's, yeah, she did. I mean, I can not give her a prize. <laughs> I was, uh, she didn't get a prize. She gave a workshop at there one time, and I used to think potters were just overrated and um, over expensive. And uh, so I did, I tried to build my little pot there. I, I had a pot like that in mind. That thing started flaring out like this. She had to come over, pat, 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 and it'd be like it. I wanted it again, then it started flaring out again. And um, I had a totally different attitude about that after that workshop. And uh, my wife left my finished product. And then she had to go class in and she'd make a pot, but I had to laugh hers. <laughs> as sad as mine was, is better than hers. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I, mean, I, I love potters now. They do a great job. And <laughs> Have you taken several workshops there in other media? Uh, in basketry. In basketry. And I don't know why they say the basketry is for the people who are nuts. Uh, that stuff will run you nuts. <laughs> yeah, the first pattern I did was a fish scale. And it's, Three over three under. I thought it's really God I got to three. Get that last side, here's two. <laughs> well, I think it, it seems like the show has played a role in the whole um, revival of a lot of traditional Cherokee arts as well. As yeah. well. Thank you, Mike Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a personal level, you mentioned the Martha Berry piece. Uh, is there any other art that you especially treasure that you Oh, there is, Dale, like for sure. Show? It, um, for my retirement, first of all, I got the uh, watch here for going away, but uh, Betty Farrell from Brown Village uh, wove a uh, mat for me. They framed it and everything, and uh, it's called the Unbroken Friendship. It's probably 20 by 20 or so. That's beautiful. And just the sentiment behind it is what I really treasure, and uh, so that's my new favorite piece. <laughs> and around the house, I do have a couple of Mike Daniel pots that uh, he would probably uh, pay me handsomely to take them out of uh, his, some of his earliest pieces. Oh. And, uh, yeah, those are valuable. It, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, these, these are nothing like what it does now, and. Uh, but I treasure those because, again, I have a, I've known Mike all my life, and I treasure that friendship, and uh, still I treasure the pottery. What advice would you give to a native art collector who was just starting to acquire native art? Well, I don't know. I'd say uh, buy what you like, and not try to buy it for the. Uh, you're trying to get to go buy yourself later on. Don't don't let that be a factor. Just buy what you want to buy, and, cause, and uh, but by all means get out to these shows and meet the artists because that's to me what makes the pieces special. Is if you know the person, I don't care to buy a piece if I don't know the person. That's Bertie. I look forward to him with all of his mats. You know, him leave. <laughs> You sure remember them? You see all those things. Like, yeah, yeah, that's that guy. Getting <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to Robbie Murcher too. I remember him like Coyote. I just, I think it's a shame the way he died. But um, yeah, he just. We sure, we sure lost a good one there. We did. I just can't believe that about 
She goes, she said, make that statement about him. I just don't, I never do it. He'll never be aggressive like that. Mm-hmm. About how I felt leaving the museum after 38 years, you get that much of your life invested in one place, and uh, it's it's a part of you. And, uh, it's not I'm, easy, is it? I said when I turned the keys over, I thought I was going to have a breakdown moment there, but I, I didn't get past that one. I, it just, it's so weird to think to go out there now, I'm going to be just another guest, and the uh, I don't have a key to that door. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm still on extended vacation right now. It's not, I haven't really got the reality to sit in on fully, but uh, I do enjoy sleeping in the mornings though. <laughs> so the hours are great and the play is lousy. Uh, it's time to leave though. I mean, they've got a great guy replacing me out there, Jerry Thompson, and um, he's going to do a wonderful job for him, I'm sure. And, of course, I'm always available if they want to call me up and say, uh, What's in that box over there? I'll try to tell them what I know about it. Will you volunteer at the art shows anymore? Well, the spirits will and bodies. Uh, I got this new van the other day to carry this chair around, and so I, yeah, if I can get out there and do that, I'll be glad to. <laughs> I can drink wine legally now, too, if I go out there. <laughs> That's a bit off limit staff, so now I can. Um, well, is there anything we've uh, left out that you'd like to add? Anything we forgot to talk about? I don't think so. I, think I should talk about it. Well, I'll tell you one story about uh, what happened to home, all these judging things. Um, I'll name names on this one. <laughs> is Dick West and uh, a guy from IAIA. I think it was Brophy. I'm not sure. But um, when the show had ended, we. Uh, said goodbye to the judges and everything. And uh, I started typing up the winners and realized we didn't have a winner in one category. We had second and third and honorable mention. So I called Dick West over at Fort Gibson and uh, said, uh, Dick, we got a problem here. And, well, can you move second up to first and third up to second? Yeah, do that. And uh, pick you do uh, third place out of the uh, honorable mentions? Yeah. Which one? Oh, I don't know, whatever JJ goes, or whoever it was. Mexico guys goes with, I'll take it. Okay. So I let him get back to Mexico and I call that guy, well, whatever Dick says, be okay with me. And uh, we finally got them together and got a piece of name. That was one of the biggest mix ups I had. <laughs> well, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs>